The West Highlands of Scotland contain some of the most beautiful scenery in the world. It's no wonder that the West Highland Railway, from Fort William to Malig, is reputed to be Britain's most spectacular. In 1985, following the success of the previous year, ScotRail operated a regular steam service over the line. Many a passenger has enjoyed magnificent views from the carriage window, but the only way to see the actual line is from the cab. Ben Nevis, Britain's highest mountain at 4,409 feet above sea level, towers over Fort William. Established on the shores of Loch Linney in 1654, the original fort took its name from William of Orange. The West Highland Railway reached here in 1894. A branch line to Banavie Pier just outside Fort William opened a year later. It was to this line that the Malik extension was connected, and it opened in 1901. The first half of our trip takes us 26 miles from Fort William through Glenfinnan to Loch Ayot. A new station and travel centre was opened in 1969, replacing the original Fort William station a quarter of a mile further south. Our locomotive is this magnificent Stania Class 5, 460 George Stevens, named after one of the fathers of steam railways in this country. Built at Crewe in 1947 by the London, Midland and Scottish Railway, ironically, the loco only served one day for the LMS before passing into the hands of the newly nationalised British Railway. And so we're off on the road to the islands. The West Highland Line is a vital link to the Isles off the west coast. Normally, four trains a day connect with the ferry to the Isle of Skye, but the steam excursions are unashamedly round trips just for pleasure. Almost immediately, we cross the River Nevis, which flows down from the Great Glen of the same name. We're now approaching Malek Junction. This is where we leave the main West Highland line to Glasgow Queen Street.
controlled by single line tokens, the first section between Malek Junction and Banavi is one and three quarter miles and virtually level. Just after Fort William Depot, the line begins a gradual 180 degree turn that will bring us to our westerly heading at Banavi. As we cross the River Lochie, we leave the outskirts of Fort William and head out over Corpac Moss. Once totally underwater, today the moss is still too boggy for anything but the railway. There is virtually no trace today of Banavi Junction, from where the original line of 1895 ran to Banavi Pier, about half a mile north of here on the Caledonian Canal. There it was possible to catch a steamboat right up to Inverness. It's no secret that the West Highland Railway's ultimate aim was also to get to Inverness, but bitter rivalry with the already established Highland Railway brought these plans to nothing. The Banavi Pier line closed in 1939, and the track was lifted in 1950. The second token section is from Banavi to Annat Sides, two miles. The Caledonian Canal is spanned by a swing bridge with a speed limit of five miles per hour. This is where, on January the 21st, 1897, Lady Cameron of Loch Hill had the honour of turning the first shovel of earth on the Malig extension. Parliament set a time limit of five and a half years to completion of the 39 miles and 53 chains of new line. The West Highland Railway Malig Extension Act was passed on the 31st of July, 1894. But before the act was implemented, a guarantee bill had to be passed. The line was to run through such sparsely populated country that it was unlikely that it would ever generate a capital return. The bill, sponsored by the Tory government, proposed a guaranteed return for shareholders. The Liberal opposition vehemently opposed on principle, and it took two years to go through. In that time, the original West Highland line contractors, Lucas and Aird, were lured away by more certain work in the south. So in 1896, a new team had to be employed. The contractors were Robert McAlpine and Sons, the engineers Simpson and Wilson, all from Glasgow. Corpac and a speed restriction of 10 miles per hour over the level crossing. To all intents and purposes, Corpac is a suburb of Fort William. It's here that boats on Loch Linney gain access to the Caledonian Canal.
the line has often been under the threat of closure, never more so than in the 20s and 30s. And the coming of various heavy industries, such as this pulp and paper mill at Annet, brought much needed revenue. Four miles out from Fort William, and suddenly the very last vestiges of Fort William and Corpac have gone, and we head into the country proper. From Annat onwards, Loch Linney has become Loch Eel, and for the next six and a half miles, the line follows the northern shore. Building this stretch of line proved to be as easy as Robert McAlpine had calculated. From one end of Loch Eel to the other, the line rises only 33 feet, and is able to roughly follow the natural lie of the land. Only 17 sea walls had to be built in 12 and a half miles. Access can seldom have been easier, for the contractor's supplies were brought by boat right up to the specially constructed piers within yards of the workings. The very latest halt on the line only opened at the start of the 1985 season. It's called Loch Eel Outward Bound, after the adjacent adventure camp. This section, alongside Loch Eel, is the fastest on the line, with a maximum official speed limit of 40 miles per hour.
Around the next bend is Loch Eelside. The steam excursions don't normally stop there, and for that matter, neither do the diesels. Loch Eelside is shown in the normal timetable as a request stop, probably due to the fact that you can count the number of houses here on two hands. One can quite clearly see the peak here from a 1 in 80 rise to a 1 in 74. Within the space of a few hundred yards, the three-quarter of a mile wide Loch Eel ends really quite abruptly, and we now head towards the highlands themselves. We're now within three miles of the Glenfinnan Viaduct. Robert McAlpine was one of the pioneers in the use of mass concrete. The majority of bridges and viaducts on the main line were built of stone. However, McAlpine found that the stone on the Malig route was virtually unworkable, and so an alternative had to be found. Concrete was the answer. The structures would require far less maintenance than iron or steel, an important consideration for such a remote line. In addition, they would blend in better with the magnificent scenery. Last but not least, concrete offered an overall reduction in cost of some 20%. We're now climbing for the next six miles through Glenfinnan to the line summit at an average gradient of one in 70.
The engineers, Simpson and Wilson, had anticipated only two tunnels being required for the entire Malig extension. But when in 1901 they took stock, it turned out that they had needed no fewer than 11. This is the first, and like most tunnels on the line, is unnamed. Glenfinnan Viaduct is undoubtedly the most spectacular on the line. It has 21 arches stretching 1,248 feet across the Finnan Valley, at a maximum height of 100 feet. The speed limit is just 25 miles per hour. It's at Glenfinnan that Bonnie Prince Charlie first raised his standard in 1745. And this monument, built over a hundred years later, commemorates the spot. Glenfinnan Station and the exchange of tokens signifying the end of the 12-mile section from Annette Sidings. Although our driver, Sandy Cameron, drives diesels most of the year, he started on steam engines in 1945. First as a fireman, and 12 years later as a driver, all in the Fort William area. There's still a great deal of steam experience about, for Alec Howie was also a fireman in steam days. It's his job today to shovel no less than one and a half tons of coal during our 42 mile trip. He's then got another one and a half tons on the way back.
We're now two and a half miles out from Glenfinnan, and at the highest point on the whole line, 361 feet above sea level. Inside any railway tunnel, water usually falls days after the last rain. But 1985 has been declared Scotland's worst ever summer since records began. And countless steam crews have got thoroughly soaked. It's even worse on the return leg, because with no turning facilities on the line, 44767 has to return tender first. And that means the cab is literally open to the heavens. The line is now plunging down towards Loch Eald at an even greater rate than the climb, 1 in 50. Leveling out now alongside Loch Eald. Even though it's spelt the same as Loch Eel, but with the addition of a T, there is absolutely no physical connection, unless you count the railway and the road. Because there is no connection between the various locks en route to Mali, today's 42 miles by train used to be over 100 by water. The route took the intrepid travellers all the way down Loch Linney in a southwesterly direction, west through the Sound of Mull, and from there north to Mali, 50 miles up the Atlantic on the west coast. When Thomas Telford brought the first road to these remote parts in 1815, a coach used to ply back and forth between Areseg and Fort William. But even this improvement was only available three times a week. And the journey time for the 34-mile trip was a wearisome seven hours.
Lockheed was one of the few places that Thomas Telford would have disagreed with Simpson and Wilson, for the road and railway run on opposite sides. We're now leaving the banks of Lockheed and about to cross the river Eyalt, which we then follow all the way up to Loch Eyalt. Twenty-five miles out from Fort William, we now start our final climb up towards Loch Eyot, at a gradient of one in seventy. So we approach Loch Eyot. 85 years ago, it was a hub of activity. Here was the largest construction camp on the line, housing over 3,000 navvies, 40 to a hut. All sorts of facilities were laid on to cater for the timbermen, plate layers, tunnelers and horsemen. Most novel of which was a small hospital established in the old schoolhouse. From Loch Eyot, the West Highland Line continues on its westerly path for eight miles to Ariseg and seven and a half due north through Mora to Malik. The railway had been planned to run to a terminal at Rochefort, some five miles southwest of Loch Eyot. The Admiralty of the day described Rochefort as the best natural harbour on the west coast of Scotland. But due to local opposition, principally by landowners, the Rochevin plan was scrapped. On leaving Loch Eyot, the change in terrain encountered by McAlpine is immediately apparent. From here to Ariseg, proved to be the most costly section to build. Nine of the 11 tunnels on the line are to be found in the space of the next eight miles. Ironically, one of McAlpine's sons, Malcolm, was admitted to the hospital, gravely injured while supervising a routine rock blast along this stretch of line. McAlpine Sr., informed that his son was dying, went to superhuman lengths to try to save his life. Not least of which was his incredible overnight dash from Glasgow on the main West Highland line with Scotland's most eminent physician, Sir William McEwan. The line had long since been shut for the night, 
leaving no signalman to operate tokens, points or signals, and thus an extremely hazardous journey ensued. But they made it, arriving in Fort William in the early hours. During the course of the following week, the young McAlpine was moved very carefully from Loch Ayort all the way to McEwen's nursing home in Glasgow. Progress was painfully slow. Stretcher bearers carried him much of the way, as roads were far too rough to contemplate. A succession of boats and trains followed, with the patient arriving in Glasgow two days later. The effort proved to be well worthwhile, for Malcolm McAlpine not only made a complete recovery, but lived right up until 1967. Eight 50-foot spans crossing the glen at the head of beautiful Loch Nanwar, Loch of the Caves. How clever of McAlpine to so perfectly match the bridge with the surroundings. It would have been all too easy to ruin this beautiful view, beyond the loch and out to the sound of Arisaig. Riding with us is George Stevenson's owner, Ian Storey. The locomotive had been in active service 20 years to the day, when it was withdrawn in 1967. Ian rescued it six years later from a scrap dealer in Wales. Its restoration to its current condition is self-evident. But it's interesting that 44767's fate was so close that its tender had already been cut up. What you see today is class five number 44950's tender, which admirably doubles for the original. Ian accompanies roughly a third of George Stevenson's 50 or so round trips to Malay in a year. On the other runs, Richard Campbell looks after his interests. When she's not on the West Highland, George Stevenson pulls specials out of Carnforth for the Steam Locomotive Operators Association, such as the Cumbrian Coast, and Cumbrian Mountain Expresses, the latter running over the famous Settle and Carlisle line. In active service, the loco first worked out of Liverpool Bank Hall, then Southport, and finally at Carlisle's Kingmore Depot. We're now passing Beesdale, built as a private station to serve Arasegg House a mile to the west. Today, it's an unstaffed public halt, trains stopping by request. The block signalling section from Glenfinnan ends at Arisaig, a total of 18 miles. From here, one can catch a ferry to the islands of Egg, Muck and Rum.
Arasaig is the last place where two trains can pass. As from here to Mali, the line is run strictly on the one engine only basis. The line now takes the turn to a northerly heading. Following the gentle climb from Arisaig, we now drop at a rate of 1 in 55 for just over 3 miles, onto the floor of Kepok Moss. One mile west is our first sight of the Atlantic Ocean. McAlpine had to literally float the line across Kepok Moss on tons of turf and brushwood, in a manner first used, ironically, by George Stevenson himself at Chat Moss some 70 years before. Here, the railway and the road part company again. The road being the loser by taking the hilly, narrow and winding coastal route some two miles to the west on the other side of Kepak Moss. In the years before the railway came to the west coast of Scotland, decades of neglect, government indifference, and of course, primitive transport had led to the area being described as one of the most backward in the whole of Europe. Even today, we're passing through one of the least populated areas in the United Kingdom, with only a handful of residents per square mile. In the first year of opening, the total revenue from freight and passenger traffic amounted to 40% of the actual running costs, the rest being paid by the government under the terms of the guarantee bill. In later years, the ratio averaged slightly higher, at 50%. But by the end of 1908, the West Highland passed lock, stock and barrel into the ownership of the North British Railway Company.
The road and railway meet again, just before the bridge over the River Mora. The river flows from Scotland's deepest loch, Loch Mora. And like Loch Ness, it's reputed to contain a monster. We are now looking out over Mora Bay, the extremely fine sheltered beaches creating a mini holiday resort in the summer. Mora is another unmanned station at which the line crosses the main road. Until this year, Level crossing gates had to be opened and closed by the train crew. Six minutes used to be allowed for the process. Today, the gates have gone, and the more efficient barrier system installed. Forty miles from Fort William, we now begin a two-mile-long final descent down to sea level at Malik, at an average gradient of one in a hundred. And so we arrive alongside the Atlantic Ocean. It's normally a five and a half hour journey by train all the way from Glasgow. And in that 165 miles, the weather can change dramatically. Over the 84 years of the line's operation, many a passenger has left Glasgow in the pouring rain, only to find himself half a day later in glorious sunshine, with warm westerly breezes coming in off the Atlantic. Shoehorned between the rocks and the ocean, we reach the end of the line. From the first earthworks at Korpak in 1897 to the last at Malig in 1901, just over four years elapsed. Since that opening day on April the 1st, 1901, life on the hitherto remote islands off the west coast has never been the same. For today's traveller, rail and road are still the only practical methods of travel. The nearest airport is over 75 miles away at Inverness. And as long as that remains the case, a trip to Malig and beyond will conjure up a sense of great adventure 
only possible where remoteness and scenery blend together in harmony. Our much photographed train departs promptly at 10.15 on the so-called Road to the Isles. It's a rare day when Lochiel looks as tranquil as this. 